Hey guys, and welcome back to the Who Cares Anyway podcast. So for the second week in a row, unfortunately, we're not exactly live, and but it is Friday night when you are watching this, uh, watching this little video on YouTube, uh, the premiere, or if you're listening on the audio on the podcast feed, uh, welcome, welcome to the show. So today, uh, at least for this first little bit, it's just me. It's just Chris Doman. Uh, you know, it's kind of weird. This is these are like the two busiest weeks I will have all year, but I still wanted to make sure that we have some uh, some good content coming out to you guys. And something that, uh, well, the reason I'm actually going to be out all weekend is uh, it is the 32nd anniversary for the church I work at. So when we have guests coming from all over the world, you know, India, Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana, a uh, bunch of other places, South Africa, you know, and we're gonna be, uh, you know, doing doing our thing. Um, and I've been with that church now for five years as the sound engineer, which uh, has been a lot of fun. So yeah, but I still wanted to get something out to you guys. I still wanted to get a show out because you know consistency is a good thing, and obviously, I still love doing the show. So I will do whatever I can to make sure that I can still give something out to you guys. And there will be some uh, something else coming this weekend. Um, uh, so first, a little bit, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, as you guys have already noticed, hopefully, uh, we have launched the Facebook group, Dedicated Art. Just look it up on on uh, Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash group slash D2A channel. You can uh, join up there. And uh, you know, if you got something you want to promote, you can put a link in there, and uh, we'll have conversations about you know film, music, art, you know fan leagues, schmodown. Whatever the hell's on your guys' minds. Like honestly, if you want to start a conversation in there, by all means, just start it and you know, let's let's make it happen. So in addition to all that other stuff, uh you know, um I was gonna originally do uh, just have Nico come on for the first hour and we would talk about New York and whatnot. And we taped something last night to uh to do that, but something uh rather unfortunate happened. We went almost two hours just talking about our experience in New York. So what I'm going to do is on Sunday night at the same time, uh, 8.30 Eastern, 7.30 Central, 5.30 Pacific, uh, that, w- that will be a bonus episode of the Who Cares Anyway podcast, and I know you guys are going to enjoy that as well. Uh, just sort of talking about New York, talking about our experience of finally meeting in person for the first time. And Nico will delve into the story of the contract and why he for some reason thought that was a good idea, even though... Look, Nico, I love you to death, I really do, but you probably should have thought that one through a little better. <laughs> Alas, what are you going to do? But uh, with, with all that said, uh, let's let's dive on into some news. Um, if there's any other bits of housekeeping that I'll uh, suddenly remember, I will bring that up at a later time. But uh, yeah, just some things that I wanted to, you know, go through as far as the news, uh, some things I wanted to touch on, and let's hop on in, starting with something that did come out last week, but, you know, because of the pre-tape, we didn't get to get around to it then, and I just want to give some quick thoughts on the Obi-Wan Kenobi TV series, which, you know, as you guys know, I'm very excited for. I have been dying to get something involving Ewan McGregor back in the role of Obi-Wan, and we've gotten, we've gotten confirmation that the show is going to take place uh, roughly around the time of Solo, a Star Wars story, about eight years or so after Episode Three: Revenge of the Sith. And I'm excited for that. I- I'm really excited to see where his story can go because, at- and yes, there have been some comics that have detailed like little bits and pieces of events, you know, uh, maybe like a couple years after Sith and like a couple years before New Hope. But there hasn't really been that much detail, and while not everybody wants that story, I personally do because I think it's one of the most. I think this is an opportunity to give one of the most fascinating character studies of uh, of a character who is this beloved, and this will probably will be the last time we see Obi Wan in any big capacity. So yeah, let's you know, kind of like Logan before him, let's close out you know, Ewan's time as Obi-Wan with with a big with a big dive into just the character. Cause a point that I've seen in a lot of critiques of the prequels is that Obi-Wan should have been the primary protagonist 
of of the prequel trilogy. And while I respectfully disagree, I do think there is some merit to to seeing what a more focused Obi Wan story would have been, and that, and this is the perfect place for us to finally get that story. You know, much to the chagrin of all the geeks and gamer assholes, you know, those kind of people who call themselves Star Wars fans, but realistically, they like, to, you know, two two or three of the movies, and they just pretend everything else doesn't exist because it ruins their childhood. Wah. What are you going to do? <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, and what I also am fascinated by with uh, the with the time period of the Obi-Wan series is that there has been some rumors about the possibility of subtly sneaking in uh, little nods to Solo. You know, maybe, maybe we'll see Crimson Dawn. Maybe we'll get Kira or, uh, or Dryden Voss or, I mean, hell, possibly Maul. Like personally, I wouldn't want that because I think uh, Rebels handled Maul and Obi-Wan's final story perfectly, just perfectly. But it would be cool to see, uh, you know, just again little little nods to to that era of Star Wars, which I actually quite like. Like, I mean, I know a lot of people are sort of meh on Solo. I did quite enjoy it because of the lore and what it added to the overall galaxy of Star Wars. So there is that, and uh, <clears throat> sticking with the whole you know fantasy stories that I I really really want to see guys you you know I, I i happen to quite like anime i like anime a lot and i think there's a there's, there's an anime film that i don't think gets the appreciation that it truly deserves and that is tales from earthsea the uh goro miyazaki film from 2007 i quite like it it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, I'll even dare say it is fairly flawed as a film. But what I like so much about it is I like the I like the I like the story that you know builds around it, and I like how uh, our our main protagonist is a very flawed character from the get go. Because first things first, like when we introduce him. He kills his father, who is the king, and he goes, takes his sword, and he runs off, and then he meets up with a wizard. He meets up with another couple of other companions. One of them he develops a little bit of a romantic affection for, but they have to fight this evil sorcerer named Ko. Uh, and the, the, the film kind of does all three books in one film, so it's, it's a little bit rushed in that regard. But what's cool is that there is actually a... A television series that is currently in development, uh, brought to us by A24, who have just been crushing it in in film over the last over this past decade. I mean, hell, two of my favorite films, you know, period, have come out from this from the studio. Uh, and, you know, Lady Bird came out through them. Disaster Artist came out through them. Eighth Grade came out through them. Like, there's just they've been on. A, they've they've de- released so much good content. And because they know how to really focus on telling a story and not necessarily, you know, and, and not like, you know, trying to be cheap, like a, a Corman group or uh, a Canon group, Golden Globus kind of thing. But I think that what they're, what they can, what they can really achieve with this is, you know, keeping the art- artistic integrity, but without actually, you know, sacrificing anything just for the sake of saving money. They know how to use their budgets smartly, kind of like Blumhouse in that regard. So, you know, and if we're going to get a, a big old fantasy series based on these books by Ursula Le Guin, I'm very curious to see what, what, what they can do. And, uh, yeah, guys, Tales from Mercy, like look, like look up the movie if you have a chance, because I, I, I will defend it, even though I will say it's not perfect, but I do think it's still pretty solid throughout. So, guys, if you get the chance, give that, give the movie a watch. You know, and <clears throat> in addition to all the other uh, f- fun things with 
all these like you know blockbusters and big stories that we're telling. Um, you know how for the longest time we've been talking about how Dune is just like the it movie because literally everybody's in it. You know, Oscar Isaac, Dave Bautista, Timothy Chalamet, Zendaya, uh, and a whole bevy of people that seriously like I'm just so excited for Daniel Villeneuve's next film. Well, a lot of people are also saying the same thing about The Suicide Squad, James Gunn's upcoming 2021 film that, you know, the cast the cast is continuing to expand, you know, and, you know, already we still have uh, Viola Davis, Margot Robbie, Joel Kinnaman, Jai Courtney uh, coming back from the original 2016 film, but then, you know, we also talked about how uh, David Das Malchian is going to be joining in, Idris Elba, Nathan Fillion, Taika Waititi, but now they're adding in two new two more people to this cast that's ever growing. That including uh, SNL uh, superstar Pete Davidson, and this is exciting me as a Doctor Who fan, Peter Capaldi, the Twelfth Doctor. And on the one hand, I'll say Pete Davidson's gonna be too recognizable unless you give him a role where he can just completely immerse himself, but you don't get Pete Davidson to actually, you know, act. You get him to be funny. You get him to bring provide comic relief. And I'm just a little worried that uh, that Gunn is kind of going to pull a Guardians 2 in that regard, where they're going to focus more on just having random moments where they're funny and not necessarily having him be a character that actually, like, cements himself in the movie. Like, we're not exactly going to have El Diablo, who, sure, when you look at him, he's immediately, you just think of him as a thug, but he winds up being one of the best characters in 2016 Suicide Squad. And I do realize I'm a lot nicer to that film than most people because, not shockingly, I actually kind of liked it because it was kind of terrible. You know, they got your whole, this katana, don't get killed by her, her sword carries the soul of its victims. Yeah, that's still terrible. You know, but simultaneously, Peter Capaldi, on the other hand, is an actor who I think could definitely class up a movie like Suicide Squad. Because seriously, watch watch most of the episodes where he is the Doctor in Doctor Who, and he brings the perfect amount of, you know, uh, I'd, I'd say curmudgeonly charm. He brings a lot of good comedy to it. And... He also has, a, you know, an intelligence to him. He's got a good sense of uh, serious acting mixed with comedic comedic timing that I think could actually make The Suicide Squad a lot more charming than its predecessor. And, again, when you add him into the cast, that's already getting pretty stacked. I just can't help but get excited, you know, because, come on. It's Peter Capaldi. Every time he's on screen, he's kind of he's kind of like another Doctor Who actor, David Tennant, where anything he's in, he just instantly makes it better, even if the starting out is kind of crap. I mean, hell, you know, Capaldi uh, was in World War Z for all of three seconds, and I actually quite uh, quite liked his quite liked his his scenes. But with that, guys, I want to get into something for. Just a little bit here. So, it's kind of funny that I mentioned that I work at a church. And when 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 people would, when I say that, people actually kind of look at me with a little bit of shock. Because they're like, well, Chris, aren't you anti-religion? Aren't you anti-Christianity? It's like, not exactly. Because, look, whatever is someone's personal beliefs, if you're using it to better yourself and better the people around you, I have no quarrel with you. When I have a quarrel with you, it's because you try to justify being a crappy person by way of, well, being a crappy person. And what I find even more hilarious is the simple fact that the Catholic Church, God love them. They just love drawing up controversy, whether it's through you know covering up the, mol- the molestation of thousands of little boys all across the world, whether it's trying to disown any uh, form of media that calls them out on their crap, which a lot of it has, and thank God for it. Otherwise, most of these stories would never have gotten out in the first place. Or even something as simple as 
banning banning fiction that they don't understand. You know, and this happened back in the eighties with stuff like Dungeons and Dragons. This happened, you know, uh back in the nineties again with more Dungeons and Dragons and with the rise of computer games and fantasy, like they they had to they they, they at first they just tried to combat all of that with just more Christianized forms of media, you know, uh, just look at James Rolfe's great uh, Bible games episode of Angry Video Game Nerd for just for the proof of the kind of nonsense that they would try to throw at kids to be like, no, you don't want to follow those things. You want to follow this because it tells you about Jesus. And and for the record, like I, I work at the church that I do because, I mean, A, they're non-denominational, so they don't have any ties to synods or other communities like the Catholic Church. You know, they're, they're just a bunch of people who have a very firm belief, firm, very firm foundation in their beliefs, and they stick to it. But they also don't go out of their way to be like, we are going to force this down your throat, and you are going to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. One of the things that I really appreciate about my bishop is that... And he has said this much in in service, where I'm not out to to convert the entire world. I'm out to help the people who want this in their life. The choice is theirs. I'm not here to make any decisions on their behalf. I'm not here to judge anybody who may have found their other way. But I am here to help those who want to be helped. That's something very admirable, and that's something that I, I thoroughly appreciate. Unlike what this nonsense over the banning of Harry Potter books at this one Nashville Catholic school. Now, it's not the it's not the actual banning itself that's got me frustrated. It's the it's their reasoning why. It's the same kind of crap where they ban heavy metal music and they ban Dungeons and Dragons and they ban Lord of the Rings and all of these. <coughs> Excuse me. They ban all these other stories that you know aren't aren't based in 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 religion that aren't based in Christianity. And it's like, guys, you do know that there are other you know ideologies in the world, right? And we can coexist with them, right? Because the last time that you guys were convinced that there was no other way, we got the Crusades, and that lasted for hundreds of years, and it cost hundreds, th- hundreds of thousands of lives. You know, some say that the sands in Jerusalem are still rained, are still stained red with blood, and you know what? They're they're right. You know, if you just would go dig under the sand, you could probably find thousands of skeletons of soldiers. You know, still with bows, arrows, swords, and spears, and they'd all they all would have thought at the time that they were in the right for dying for what they thought they believed in. When, no, I'm sorry, they they weren't. They weren't right for trying to murder. You know, trying to commit genocide just because they thought God told them to. Hmm. Boy, why doesn't that sound familiar in America's day and age? Oh, wait a minute. But what I think my other my other personal beef with this whole thing is it feels a, like a desperate move for the Nashville Catholic Church, the, the, the Diocese of Nashville to, you know, attempt to get more lost, quote unquote, lost souls into their congregation so that way they in turn can make more money. And I, 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 and I'm sure that's not what it actually is, but that's how it, that's how it's playing right now, and it just feels cheap. And I don't know, guys. Feel free to call me on my crap if you think I'm wrong. Like it, it's possible I could just be talking out of my ass, but it 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 doesn't feel right. It just doesn't feel right. So by all means, you know, and I'm not gonna be like, oh, well, go go to Twitter and tell the Diocese of Nashville that they're wrong. I'm not like, no, no, guys, you know me. I'm not like that. I don't want to be that guy. But this is something to me that I do think we need to call them on their crap for. And I think it's fair that we do. So 
that that calls yours. I I know that. I know that also in hindsight, we're just waiting. We're just waiting for when stuff like the MCU and Doctor Strange, which really focuses on magic, we're waiting for that to get to get you know pulled. And it, it, it'll it'll happen at some point. Just don't don't worry. It'll it'll happen. Oh, <sighs> yeah. Sorry about that, guys. I guess I just felt like uh, really letting them have it. <laughs> But it's not the only thing that's kind of frustrating as far as unfair, uh, unjust calling out of you know, de- denial of people's status just because you know of what, or denial of something's existence just because of what they are. You know. Now let me say something perfectly clear: I'm not a fan of Twilight. Sort of. I actually kind of en- I kind of enjoy the movies a little bit from a like a stupid dumb perspective because I don't think they're good. I don't think they're good in any capacity. I don't think they're well written. I don't think they're well acted. Look, God, God love the director of the first one for trying, but she had no material to work with. Straight up, she had no material to work with. So I don't blame Kristen Stewart's career for where she seems to be heading because. She's not a bad actress. Just like a panic room. Arguably, in my opinion, Fincher's most underrated film. And she is phenomenal in that film. As the uh, as the diabetic daughter to Jodie Foster. Um, but there, there has been a couple of things coming out where she, she, she did a cover story for Variety. And... She actually talked about, <laughs> you know, where she was essentially told by, uh, by by people, you know, people with a lot of power in Hollywood, that if you if you do yourself a favor and don't go out holding your girlfriend's hand in public, she might get a Marvel movie. Um. Hollywood, I have a I have a legitimate question for you. Why do you care? Why do you care? Seriously, I mean this is the same thing as when she was you know having an affair with the director of uh, Snow White and the Huntsman back when she was still dating Robert Pattinson. Why did why, why why do we care? Like why? And here's a better question: Why should we care about her personal relationship? So what? She's dating a woman. She's bisexual. Cool, awesome. You know. And sure, maybe I'm just coming at the perspective of I'm not getting any, so I should at least support people who are getting some. You know, and maybe yeah, why not? But simultaneously, guys, and feel feel free to fill me in. Why do we care? And why should we care? Because I don't. And why isn't she? Why isn't she in a Marvel movie or something? Like, is it honestly just because she's a lesbian or bisexual? I mean, why? Plus, she is actually getting. You know, she, I mean, thank God she's at least still getting work because Personal Shopper was a pretty good film, and I do have a little bit of hope for Charlie's Angels coming out later this year. I, I don't have hope for the film per se, but I do have hope for her and Nomi Scott that I will, you know, that I'll still be entertained by the film. But again, I just have to double down on why do we care if she's, you know publicly displaying affection with her significant other. Who cares? And again, she should get a Marvel movie. I mean, actually, you want to know what would be kind of fun? Give her Sue Storm. I think she's got the kind of, you know, she's got the kind of subtlety that I think someone like Sue Storm needs. You know, when you had... Uh, Kate Mara do it. She kind of did nothing with the role. And Jessica Alba, at the time, I'll dare say it, I think she was too attractive to be Susan Storm. Like, I actually mean that. 
Like you need someone, in my opinion, for for Sue Storm, you need someone who you know, yes, is attractive, but also can sort of play a little bit of shy. Like her her power has to kind of match her personality, and Kristen Stewart it can be very good at playing, you know, relaxed and shy and not necessarily always boisterous and out front. So. And if you're going to deny her that just because, you know, she holds her girlfriend's hand in public, well, screw you too, guys. Screw you too. Because I want to see that. Yeah, sure, I'm just a dumb white guy, but I still want to see it. Make it happen. Quit being stupid. Uh, I felt good. Get a couple of rants in. But not, not, not passionate rants, because, you know, I... And, it, I'm actually kind of glad that I have been, you know, sort of gone, quote-unquote, these past couple of weeks. So I haven't really been keeping up with anything. And, you know, this way I'm sort of able to just sort of relax and focus on things from, from kind of a outsider's perspective and really, you know, look at look at the bigger picture and not necessarily focus on the little the nitty-gritty and the little details and get mad about that, where it's just like, here... Just get my thoughts and I'll get on my way, which is kind of how I feel about the uh, the Halloween Kills uh, story. Where, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. Speaking of New York, I got into a couple fun conversations about this franchise. Which, yes, guys, I love Halloween. I love the franchise. I love Michael Myers, um, and I'm sure he'd love to kill me. And you know what? If I got killed by anybody in of the slasher movie villains. I'd prefer it to be Michael. Because Jason, I think he'd be a little too gruesome with my death. And Freddy, I, I think he'd just mug for the camera the entire time. Whereas Michael, he's just very simple, straightforward. He'd get it done quick. And then I'd, you know, I'd probably get like a really cool, like rip my face off or rip my neck open or, you know, or maybe just a good old stab through the gut and like defy physics kind of way. But. Something that's actually kind of cool about uh, the, so the, the, sorry I forgot to mention the the 2018 reboot did kind of clean the slate of all the other films. You know whether it was it took away Michael and Laurie being brother and sister from Halloween two. It took away you know obviously Jamie Lloyd from Halloween's four through six. It took away uh, Michael's comeback in Halloween H two O and Resurrection and. You know, and I just pretend Rob Zombie's films didn't happen. So now we're continuing from just the original, and now the last year's sequel. So Halloween Kills is also going to be bringing back uh, a very interesting casting choice, and that is Kyle Richards, the original Lindsey Graham, who I could have sworn was in Halloween Four. Uh, as one of the supporting characters, but they never actually say if that was her. Like, and I know that in the original script, like that was sort of the plan was to sort of have her be one of the continuing characters that Michael would go after because you know she survived that fateful night in 1978. But on the other hand, I'm glad they they sort of abandoned that because now they can bring her back here, and we can see how that night affected her versus how it affected Lori. And, I mean, shit, I'd love to see Tommy Doyle, whether it's the original actor or possibly bring back Paul Rudd, who, reprising his role from Halloween 6. I'm, I'm just curious to see where they're going to take this, this story now. And, yeah, there's, like, again, four different continuities here. But it doesn't make me, make me any less interested. I still want to see what they're going to do with this story. So, with that, um, oh, and that's right, it does come at the end of next year. And yeah, sorry, guys, I'm kind of looking it up, looking up these stories, uh, also while I'm talking to these. Ah, okay, they did confirm, okay. And for Tommy Doyle, they actually are bringing in, uh, Anthony Michael Hall. Interesting. Rusty Griswold as, uh, as Tommy Doyle. Okay, so this is what I get for uh, trying to, you know, just sort of 
read the news as I'm talking to you guys versus actually, you know, taking a half hour to go through it myself. My bad. My bad. Well, I made sure that I uh, actually read this piece before truly getting into it where uh, <clears throat> Rod Serling, you know, you're entering a world. It is the Twilight Zone. Yes, the original creator of the Twilight Zone and host of the show. And it looks like we will be having a biopic about him from the director of Donnie Darko, Richard Kelly. And I'm just going to say it. I'm excited for this. The Twilight Zone is one of... It's not necessarily one of my favorite shows, but it's certainly a show that I, I'm quite passionate for. I really do. I really do like the creativity. I like the stories. I like where it goes. I like the chances that it took, especially for you know, 1959, 1960, 61. And I even like, and I especially love the legacy that's had. Where even now in 2019, we're getting an update that still pays nothing but respect to the original series. And if there's anybody as far as like the whole, you know, how XYZ movie was made, like there there's really only th- for me three three that I've yet to that I want to see. One is, you know, put Millie Bobby Brown as Judy Garland in a Wizard of Oz biopic. You know, two, I would love to see uh, essentially the making of Jaws done as a biopic because the stories that Spielberg and co. have told about the making of that movie, I need to see it on film. That just sounds crazy, and I want I, I want the the full the full version of that. But three is definitely the, the Twilight Zone. Because how did Rod Serling come up with so many creative ideas? It's the same thing as with Gene Roddenberry with Star Trek. Like, well, and you know, of course, both of them are very famous for William Shat- launching William Shatner's career. Which, by the way, please, if we can, can we get Shatner in a you know cameo in the Rod Serling biopic? I would really appreciate that, Richard Kelly. Thank you very much. Uh, um, what what I what but what I also really appreciate about about the Twilight Zone is the fact that it was. It was quote unquote mainstream horror that anybody can can have access to and that they can understand. It didn't uh, it didn't insult you for not being a fan of horror films. Instead, it respected you for not always getting it, but it respected you if you were open to it. And the beautiful thing about Twilight Zone is not every single episode was always horror related. Yeah, sure, it was very suspenseful. Usually, it had a lot of horror thriller aspects to it, but it also knew when it could be funny. It also knew when it could have heart. Uh, honestly, the the Christmas episode with the the Santa Claus, uh, the alcoholic Santa, is honestly one of the most touching episodes of of a TV show. Period. I stand by that. So, uh, and again, to come from the mind of someone like Rod Serling, I want to see what his process was. I want to see how these stories came together. So please, don't mess this up. Like you kind of, sort of did Tolkien. Sure, I appreciate Tolkien and I liked it a lot, but not the best movie of the year by any stretch of the imagination. Sorry, guys. And the uh, final piece I want to hit before uh, we hit the break is uh, about oh Linklater, Richard freaking Linklater. So Boyhood was probably the most ambitious thing that uh, the Oscar-nominated director had ever done. You know, d- doing little bits and pieces of shooting a film over the course of literally 12 years, so, you know, starting in 2000, ending in 2012, uh, something like that, roughly. That That's impressive. That's incredibly impressive. And, you know, the end product f- certainly feels feels like, like, like it was worth it. 
But now he wants to top himself, and he wants to top himself in probably the most grandiose way that a, a, vision, a, a visionary director like him could. And that is to do something that, honestly, I don't even know if it's going to be possible. So he's looking to do a, a film adaptation of the Stephen Sondheim musical, Merrily We Roll Along. I personally, I've heard bits and pieces of the music from it. I actually, I'm not very familiar with the show at all. I, all I do know is that essentially it starts, at least according to the the play. But like, I know that it starts in like 1976 and it ends in 1957. So the story is actually being told in reverse order, which is interesting. And I think you know there is a way to do that cinematically, and it, it could be pulled off, but. I forgot to mention that Linklater wants to do that in real time. You now, and he's cast some some young actors like uh, like Beanie Feldstein from Laybird and Booksmart, Ben Platt, uh, and also looking to add in Blake Jenner, who actually I surprisingly have heard of thanks to that uh, one on one interview with Christian Harloff. So thanks, Harloff. I appreciate that. So it's a good thing he's casting them young, because obviously they'll shoot the 1957, 1957 scenes right away, which of course is the ending, how funny enough. But they he wants to shoot it in real time. So he'll start, you know, probably next year, shooting the 1957 stuff, but that means it won't be until 20, 2038, 2039 when this movie actually gets released. He wants to shoot this thing over 20 years, and I don't know how else to say it. <laughs> Richard, I don't know if you're going to live that long. I don't know if anyone's going to live that long. You know, especially if you know my thoughts on the whole, you know, oh, uh, left-wing, right-wing stuff in the world. Like, ne never mind if we don't blow each other up or if the plant, if the plant doesn't kill us in the next 20 years. What what would Richard Linklater have to gain by shooting his film this way? Honestly, like, <clears throat> can someone explain that to me? Like, please, somebody explain that to me. What does he have to gain by shooting a film like Merrily We Roll Along over the course of 20 actual years? I don't get it. <clears throat> I seriously don't get it. Now, of course, there's something that I'm probably missing here, and I'm okay with that, but... Simultaneously, it it just reeks of, I'm not going to say desperation, but it reeks of tr trying to you know, kind of have his career go out with a bang. Because granted, he's made over 20 films. He, he's been in the industry forever. But I don't know if this is the right way to, you know... I, I don't know if this is the kind of commitment he wants, he should be making for the next 20 years of his life. I really don't. But then again, I'm not him. I can't make his decisions for him, and I just hope that you know, I I could I could ask him. I like I would love to I would love to sit down with Richard Linklater and talk to him about why does he want to take on such a crazy task. But until I get that answer, guys, uh, thanks for tuning in for this first uh, you know. First few minutes of the Who Cares Any podcast. We'll be back in about five minutes after a quick break, and you'll notice that I'm not I'm not on the call, but Nico will be along with his dear friends Malcolm Lay and Zadia Smith to talk about the Arrowverse crossover. You know, and obviously, uh, being that I have not caught up on that those shows whatsoever, I kind of just pressed record and walked out of the room for an hour while they did their thing. And uh, I do apologize for any uh, grainy sounding audio. So, like, I'm doing my best to try to fix it, and I hope it works. But if it doesn't, again, I apologize, guys. But we, w but next week we will be back with a regular show. And as I believe I mentioned, we will also have a bonus podcast episode Sunday night at the same time, 8:30 p.m. Eastern. For where Nico and I just talked for two hours about our experience in New York, so please don't don't miss that and enjoy the rest of the show. We'll see you guys in a bit.
my uh, my my last show that I want to bring up. And uh, yeah, sorry, Brian. I haven't bothered with the first season. I haven't bothered with the second season. I'll get to it someday. But until then, I'm sorry. You just can't compare with life is like a hurricane here in Duckburg. Lasers race cars, airplanes. It's a duck blur. Might solve a mystery or rewrite history. Duck tales, woo. Every day they're out there making duck tales, woo. Tales of daring, do bad, and good luck tales. Woo! I I'm addicted to this show. I am fucking addicted to this show. Seriously, from from minute one, it hooked me. Because yeah, I, I I obviously I'm a huge Disney fan. I grew up with the original Ducktales show and the original movie. Oh, look at these guys! You know. I don't ever, I, I treat every competitor the same. I do not ever have biases or opinions, but those gloves are weirding me the F out, my he's friend. He's got the gloves and he's got a clipboard that he just showed to the camera, the studio audience here today. It is the hit list. Now, he may be shaking Emily Rose Jacobs' hand and he's got the OJ gloves and they're OJ gloves. I'm sorry, I have to say it. Those either, are Renthal gloves. It's either OJ gloves or like weird Korean mukbang gloves. I feel like he's about to pull apart a rib. Either way. Something dirty You're happened welcome. Well, with sorry. those gloves, but he well, is here today you. as... After a... I discovered a little video game that uh, came out in 2006 that I know every single one of you metalheads played called Guitar Hero 2. <laughs> this was the, the classic. And this was the game where I discovered Anthrax. This was the game where I discovered uh, <clears throat> Alice in Chains. This was the game where I discovered All That Remains, Shadows Fall, Death Clock, uh, and so uh, Avenged Sevenfold, which will... I get the feeling, Ryan, there'll be an episode where we just talk about the Guitar Hero games and like any artist we got into through that. But We might have to. Yeah, and then the biggest one, of course, for me was Lamb of God. Because I remember trying to play this, this fairly simple song called Laid to Rest... But there was this one effing riff that got me every single time. And it's after uh, the uh, when Randy has his giant failure scream. Uh, and it goes to like that is even on a guitar hero control, that's one of the hardest licks to play out of any song. Period. But hearing that. Do you want to know what was the first thing I did? I, What's that? I looked up the actual song and I listened to it over and over again. So I, just so I could play that one damn drum lick. Uh, I have it in your memory. During that, during that, <laughs> during the, because uh, I had, because, you know, I, I'd only been playing drums for like three or four years at that point. And hearing mm. what Chris had.
What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Who Cares Anyway podcast. I hope you enjoyed the first hour of discussions for this week. But we now move on to the second hour. Quick note, we this is pre-taped from a day before. So if I'm wearing a different shirt, you know why. And what does it say on my shirt? Arrowverse champion Zadius Smith. That's because he is joining me in the co-hosting chair for this second hour, as well as Malcolm Lay. You know these boys from Multiplex. You know Zadius from my uh, previous show over at Multiplex called Crisis on Earthplex. And you know Malcolm from all of his stuff over at Take 3, as well as Full Metal Trivia's Random Division. Gentlemen, first off, how are you? Zad, start with you. How are you doing? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. I- I'm super excited to be back talking about what I love the most, the Arrowverse. And you know what? It's a little bittersweet, but it just feels good to be talking about it again. I know we have a little uh, while to the shows that actually uh, start going back up, but it, it, it's great to just get in the conversation and to know what to look forward to for this upcoming season. Absolutely, absolutely. And Malcolm Lay, how are you doing this fine evening? I'm doing pretty good. Just Ready to talk some Arrowverse. Awesome, awesome. And you know, it, it is kind of appropriate in terms of timing that we're talking about at least a DC property because today is actually the day that Season 2 of Titans drops on the DC Universe streaming app. So yeah, there's a little bit of timeliness here. But um, getting into the topic of discussion for tonight, the Arrowverse, there's a lot of stuff happening this coming season of television, including the big crossover event to end all crossover events although it probably won't be the last crossover event that takes place in this televised universe but we'll get to that in a little bit why don't we just start by just let's give a brief recap of what happened in the last crossover uh the elseworlds crossover and we'll use that to set up the first show we're going to talk about but um i guess i'll start basically what happened in elseworlds was uh the monitor gave a crazy guy a book that controls all of reality. And what does this crazy guy do with this book that controls all of reality? He rewrites it, of course. He swaps um, Oliver Queen and Barry Allen, the Flash and Green Arrow. He swaps them quantum leap style. They end up having to live uh, a mile in each other's shoes. Um, They uh, they end up going to Gotham City where they meet Batwoman. Um, They take the book from this guy. He gets it back. Uh, they fight Nora Freeze along the way. Um, and then uh, this crazy guy who had the book turns himself into an evil Superman. The real Superman then comes in, um, uh, destroys the book. Oliver makes the deal with the Monitor to um, save the lives of Barry and Kara zor a.k.a. Supergirl. And now that sort of brings us to this point in time where we've written... A few months later, we had the season finales of all the shows, and we're at this point now. Uh, pretty much sum it up, or did I forget anything? Pretty much summed up the, the crossover in the nutshell. The times that they happened, but be of the uh, of the crossover, and of course, as uh, most of uh, wasn't part of it this year. Three, well, and then it was kind of the best uh, those main three shows. It was also the best part about it was kind of like the, at least in my opinion, was the backdoor pilot also for Batwoman in the feature. So it happened in the earlier time period of Batwoman, but to that part where she is actually going to meet up with the Green Arrow where the post rules crossovers happens in her universe. Uh, and Malcolm, would you say I covered everything pretty much for Elseworlds? Um, yeah, that's like, that's pretty much the sort of, uh, the basis of what sort of happened. Um, it's just one of those craziest, um, crossovers that happened last, <laughs> but yeah. Okay. Basically the main reason I wanted to bring it up was because as Zad mentioned, it was a backdoor pilot for the first show that we are going to talk about. We are going to go basically from youngest to oldest in terms of, uh, these shows that are part of the Arrowverse. And the youngest one so far is the one coming out this October, I believe October 6th. Um, that is Batwoman, 
starring Ruby Rose as Kate Kane, a.k.a. Batwoman herself. Um, we've also got, in terms of the cast list, we have Megan Tandy uh, playing the character of Sophia Moore, who uh, is described here as a former military academy graduate and high-level private security agent who serves as one of Gotham's protectors. I have a theory about what her role will be in terms of like the Batwoman cast. Uh, we have Cameron Johnson playing Luke Fox, um, Lucius Fox's son, who in the comics eventually becomes Batwing and sort of has like an Iron Man style bat suit, which I think is really cool. I'm, I'm a fan of his and I'm glad that he's going to be getting his just due very soon. Uh, he's basically going to be basically in all of these CW shows. They have a tech guy. He's going to be the tech mm. guy. I'm pretty sure. Um, we have Nicole Kang playing the character of Mary Hamilton, which is Kate's stepsister, and she's kind of described as the polar opposite of Kate. Uh, she's an influencer in the making who um, makes it her mission to work with Gotham's underserved communities. Um, we have Rachel Scar- uh, Scarston playing the character of Alice, who I think is going to be the main antagonist of this season. Uh, she's the leader of the Wonderland gang. And her personality kind of ebbs and flows, goes from uh, maniacal to charming and back again. Uh, And she's trying to just bring anarchy to Gotham and ruin its sense of security. Uh, Doug Ray Scott is playing Jacob Kane. That's Kate's father, who's a former military colonel. Uh, He manages a private security firm called the Crows. And basically they try to do Batman's job better than Batman of keeping Gotham safe. Um... And finally, in terms of the main cast, we have Elizabeth Ann Wells playing Catherine Hamilton Kane, who's Kate's stepmother. And she's one of Gotham's most powerful citizens who uh, made her fortune as a savvy bullheaded defense contractor. And in terms of recurring characters, we have, uh, we have Sam Littlefield as Mouse, who is an employee of Alice. And we have um, LaMonica Garrett, who's playing. Uh, Marn Novu, the monitor and the anti-monitor, which again is going to play a big role in all the crossover stuff. And also um, listed as a guest starring role, which I'm assuming is also for the crossover, Burt Ward, who you may remember from the 1966 Batman. But um, So that's the cast list. Um, that's basically what all the characters are going to be. Uh, Zad, with that cast list, what, what do you think we're in for? for this season. It's going to be a pretty good season, uh, a pretty good introductory season for uh, Batwoman. Uh, again, as I said, I, they're, gonna, they're definitely going to start before the uh, the Elseworlds crossover, at least in terms of uh, happened in terms of the first season of Batwoman. And I like flashbacks Kate's life and stuff like that, but I think I'm looking. For, I'm really looking forward to to uh, hearing you say that Luke's Luke Fox is going to be in the show. I don't. I definitely don't want him to get his like bat wing uh, gradual thing that they build up to. Looking forward to it. Uh, I'm sorry, Zad, you cut out a little bit. Are you saying you were looking forward to a gradual build, or you were hoping they won't do the gradual build? Do a gradual build for uh, Luke becoming Batwing, and not just that. They don't. He doesn't need a Batwing costume, like at all. I guess that's fair. I guess that's fair. You know, in the comics, it took him. Uh, he didn't get the costume right away, and he was actually an MMA fighter in the comics. So uh, uh, mm-hmm. he he's already used to being a tough guy, and also. I think he was a military officer in the uh, Batman Bad Blood animated film. So um, um, we uh, obviously these shows kind of prove that you don't always need a costume to be a hero. And maybe that's what we'll see. And he's just like, you know what? I can be a hero without the costume, but a costume would be nice. Um, Malcolm, what about you? What are you thinking? Any of these names stand out to you? Um, I mean, I'm familiar for a couple of these names, like Dugway Scott. Um I know as someone who could have who could have been Wolverine at some stage, but um, didn't. But um, but I mean, it's an interesting cast. I can't wait to sort of see sort of how these all play out. Um, I'm pretty sure Burt Ward and Lamonica Garrett are only there for the only there for the crossover. I don't think they're going to carry on. Although Lamonica Garrett may pop up a few episodes before the crossover, but 
boot world on visual, it's only for the crossover. I I just uh, if you put your mouse over La Monica Garrett's name uh, in Wikipedia, it says La Monica Garrett is an American actor and a former professional slam ball player. What the hell is slam ball? <laughs> uh, um. Anyway, it, one of the, the names that stand out to me here is Megan Tandy playing the character of Sophie Moore, and if you and just looking at her um, her headshot, she's a good looking woman. Considering Ruby Rose, uh, uh, considering the character of Kate Kane is well known for being an out and proud lesbian, I have a feeling that Sophie Moore is going to be the main love interest of the first season. Because let's be real, it's the CW. It, you're contractually obligated to have a love interest pretty much every season. I, I do think that's true, but. She's maybe Kate's first love interest. I do hope eventually they bring over maybe later in this season uh, who played Maggie on Super on Supergirl. Uh, again, Maggie was a uh, was a, a lesbian character. Also, yeah, forget. I'm not something. sure what she in her uh, life right now, but. Zed, you're forgetting you're forgetting that Maggie lives on a different Earth. But there could be a Maggie in this universe also. I, I mean, so if it's even if it's not the original you know, that we know of, there could be another Maggie on this world. And then we have no idea how things are gonna be after. You are not wrong. You're not wrong. Oh, sorry, sorry. Technical issues, my my bad, Zed. Um I, I was just saying that I would like to see poor Rihanna. If they're going to bring Maggie back in this universe somehow, I'd like to see her uh, play um, Maggie as well. I wouldn't be opposed to it. And you are right. Obviously, when we're playing with the multiverse, that does leave room for a different Maggie to come up. Uh, it's just a matter of where does the Maggie of the Earth that we're used to, uh, where does she live? Like, does she live in Gotham City or does she live somewhere else? That's a good question. But, um, I'm just going to uh, – no title has been announced for the first episode just yet, but um, I, I think we're in for a good season here, a good introduction to this character of Batwoman. I know there are some people who are like, Ruby Rose, uh, uh, they, 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 I don't think she's a bad actor. Uh, I know there are some people who think she she's kind of just like plays herself and everything she does, but she will go above and beyond when it calls for it. Like if I don't rem- I don't know if anyone remembers, but she learned a lot of sign language uh, for her role in John Wick too. Uh, and you know when it com- uh, she used that as an opportunity to represent the deaf community uh, or the mute community uh, um, that role. And uh, obviously. She is, I believe, pansexual uh, in real life. So playing an out-and-out lesbian character, she's going to take pride, uh, and no pun intended there, she's going to take pride in this role, and she's going to want to make sure she goes above and beyond to represent the LGBTQ community uh, with as much honor and dignity and respect on this platform as she can. That's, that's a very good point. Uh, as far as Ruby Rose is concerned, I think like to give her a chance. I mean, that's how I pretty much did for all the, all of the characters that we know. No idea who Stephen Amell was. was, was or uh, he superstar. I know who Melissa Benoist was, but all, all done as their titular. Their show, so I wanted to give Ruby a chance. I I've seen Ruby in a couple. Uh, I watched uh, Orange is the New Black, but Jump Point Two. I thought she was she was good, even though she didn't say anything. Her character was. Uh, I think her character was a very cool character. Uh, using the sign language and it was just it's a great movie in the, in the first place. But uh, also, I do did remember her in Triple X. Cajun. I think I think to calm down this uh, season starts. I have not seen Triple X, uh, but uh, Malcolm, any uh, additional thoughts uh, before we move on to Black Lightning? Um, yeah, um, 
this is going to be interesting because from what I've heard is we're going to see a few of the classic Batman villains as well. So I think they said at Comic-Con that Hush was going to be involved in this somehow. But, um, but, but um, it's going to be interesting to see sort of what cameos we're going to get from um, other classic villains or characters from the Batman mythos as well that, that will probably pop up here. Uh, last thought on my end, and I think Zad already touched on this, but um, it would be cool to see Stephen Amell's wife reprise the role of Nora Freeze for just one episode, just so we can tie up that loose end. But uh, moving on to a more electric show, the second youngest of the Arrowverse shows, we have Black Lightning. And for clarification, for those who don't know, the past two seasons of Black Lightning have not tied into the official Arrowverse lineup. It takes place on a different Earth, and coincidentally, this Earth, um, strangely enough, uh, like it references the comics because the comic book line exists in this Earth. Like You can read about Supergirl and Arrow and The Flash if you're a Black Lightning character because those comics are on sale. So it, it's very interesting. Uh, and um, Chris Williams has stated, again, that I think at least for th- uh, the crossover, there will be a connection between Black Lightning and the other Arrowverse shows. So for those of you who have been waiting for the longest time, when are we going to see it? I, I think we're finally getting, getting it this season. Uh, we're getting that crossover in the crossover. Hence why it's called a crossover. I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop saying st- stupid stuff and just get back to on track here. Um, so when we last left off in season two, Tobias Whale had been put in an underground uh, jail cell, surrounded by lasers and titanium and everything in between. That's meant to hold a dangerous person in jail for a very long amount of time. Uh, so he's kind of out of the picture, at least for right now. Where we move on now is, and this has been touched a lot in the Young Justice Outsiders Season 3. Again, that's a separate show with its own continuity, but it's kind of ironic that they touched on this and now they're doing it for live action in Black Lightning. The Markovia Metahuman Wars. Um, Yeah, like, Freeland is going to be an all-out battlefield for metas as a result of everything going on with the green light drug and now with the experimental testing of all these um, of all these kids that's been going on and uh, Marco uh, like they Markovia saw what was going on in Freeland and they were like we want our own army we're preparing for the worst possible scenario here we want to uh, be the dominant meta force of the planet and now that brings us to right here so um Malcolm, let's go to you first. There's not a lot that we know other than what I said. So what kind of crazy predictions do, uh, are you going to make in regards to like what's going to happen this season? Um, well, this one's tough for me because I haven't... Admittedly, this is the run show I actually still have got to finish watching all the way down to season two. So, so basically, a lot of things um, Vigo said was a spoiler to me, but I'm, I'm not too worried about spoilers. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm honestly not too worried about spoilers, but um, but yeah, and I I think this the crossover might just be a one time thing because if you look at all the other things they're bringing in, they're just, it's just, in this crossover they're getting characters from every spectrum of um from animation and this one thing so i think it's a case of it's the excuse to get as many cameos as possible in here uh Zadius, what, what about you what do you think uh first of all uh, what i think it come on I'm really i'm still saying my prayers at night praying that tell Welling's gonna join sooner or later but that's a, that's another discussion but uh as for black lightning i'm see how during the uh into this crossover, how we loved off season two. And again, spoiler alert. Sorry, Malcolm. But uh, if I'm not mistaken, either the last scene or the second to last scene was you see Bill Duke's character walk into the uh, to their house like, listen, I know you're the new, the new little girl right here, so cute and stuff. He he's pretty much uh, a Chris Williams character that listen. About to be a war that's about to come to Freeland, so and just seeing people training for uh, for some or uh, a, 
personally in anybody that's watching our old shows. I say hate it, but I just like a section of last season. And and uh the the kids are I won't call them kids, but the young adults are black lightning's kids. Um play a much smarter character next season. And I'm looking forward to seeing how it's gonna bring into light and hopefully some new good last season we had the Masters of Disaster Tour. So I think they should have been played up for more hype, but the more uh, good matches come up uh, this upcoming season, especially seeing that by is possibly going to be, be revived next season. And, I, and for spoiler's sake, I won't say it, uh, I won't say who it is because the person in one of the two, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to Black, uh, Black Lightning Season 3 as long as people are smart. And there's no other way storylines where kids are running away from the parents. Uh, I'm assuming that the, the, um, the specific arc that Zad is talking about that irked him is the one where the, uh, the lovebirds are just running away in a train station for three episodes straight and going nowhere before they finally go back home. So stupid. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it was interesting seeing that one particular character who died in the pod and being um, potentially revived, especially considering this character got seriously messed up before dying. So, like, the fact that this character can come back from something like that is, um, yeah, this show has made it clear that um, comic book laws apply in all different shapes and sizes and ways um, for whether or not you can actually die. Um, and yeah, the, for those of you who are wondering, the Masters of Disaster, think of them as like the evil Fantastic Four, but instead of like having all their powers be metaphors for elements, their powers are straight up elemental. Um, <laughs> you, 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 have, you have a fire guy, you have a water guy, you have a wind person, and you have a, 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 an earth person. I think there's also an ice person as well. Um, but yeah, the, you basically get the gist of it. So. We're, we're just, war is coming to Freeland, and I think we're all excited for it. And again, I'm with you on the set. I want to see characters acting smart because, like, mm -hmm. it, it's kind of just a relief for me when in these shows somebody's just like, I know you guys have powers. You don't have to act dumb around me uh, because then it's like, yay. Yeah, because we live in a post-Avengers world now, where like secret identities seem kind of stupid when you look uh, when you look at how like you know everyone's on social media. All it takes is like facial recognition. You listen to a person's voice clearly enough, and you can tell, oh, my principal is Black Lightning. Okay, uh, and like especially with Zed, you you're notorious for hating the masks of the Arrowverse characters, and like Chris Williams' character, he, it, like. By the way, Chris Williams is such a smooth dude. I would love to have coffee with him. But uh, nonetheless, like the character of Black Lightning, of Jefferson Pierce, his disguise is a fucking pair of goggles. My God. Oh, my God. Where did Zad go? Where did Zad go? I have no idea. Where did Zad go? I, I, I don't know. I'm the Z-Man. I don't know where Zad is. It's, like, it's, it's amazing. He just disappeared. Oh, shit. Where did Malcolm go? Where did Malcolm go? It makes no uh, sense. Uh, we love these shows, but they do some weird shit. Okay, let's um, let's move on to Supergirl. Now, again, we don't really have a lot of information as to what's going to be different um, from this season compared to last season, other than a few key points. First, quick recap of what last season was. Imagine if Donald Trump were smart. That's basically what you got in season four, was you, you, you get the Donald Trump regime of American presidency with all the backdoor dealings and shady corporation bullshit taking place and the xenophobia. And just imagine that the Mexicans and brown people are actually green and have scales and weird ears. Uh, that's basically what season four was. And, it was a, and now season five, we're kind of like just coming out of we're trying to erase the hate and get back to a more stable place in our society. But then you have this shadow government called Leviathan that's going to be 
sort of um, having a big role in season five. And um, I, I forget in the comics what Leviathan was, but I think that they, in the original Teen Titans cartoon, they were a bit of a key plot point there. Uh, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong on that. But um, yeah, I, I um, we we have we've seen what Shadow Governments can do in like Arrow, but we haven't really seen it in Supergirl yet. Uh, unless you want to consider what Lex Luthor did as a Shadow Government, but this is a to oh, this is a full on organization with Leviathan. So um, that'll be interesting. Also, in terms of the cast, it should also be noted that uh, this is the final season for Makad Brooks playing James Olsen. Uh, he is going to be leaving around the mid-season finale. Um, and uh, in terms of the cast, we will be getting the return. Uh, um, Azi Test 5 will be returning as Kelly Olsen, James's sister. Uh, Andrea Brooks will be returning as Eve Tessmacher. Um, we've got Julie Gonzalo playing Andrea Rojas. I, was she in last season? I'm not sure. Uh, and um, Staz Nair as William Day. Um, I think he's a new person as well. And um, special guest stars include John Cryer returning as Lex Luthor. Again, we've got LaMonica Garrett uh, doing the monitor and anti-monitor stuff. Again, that ties into the crossover. Tyler Hoechlin, we know he's going to be in the crossover, but will he be in any episodes before that? That remains to be seen. Elizabeth Tulak as Lois Lane. Uh, by the way, in, we forgot to mention in the Elseworlds stuff that um, um, Lois Lane is pregnant with um, Clark Kent's child, and they've gone off to Argo City to have that baby because if they stayed on Earth, that baby would have punched right through her stomach uh, to get on out because Kryptonian biology. Uh, am I wrong? Am I wrong? You're not wrong. You're not wrong. <laughs> um, oh, this is interesting. Um, so uh, Jeremy Jordan is returning as Windshot. Megan Rath is is portraying a female Brainiac Five. Huh. Uh, we've got Jennifer Sean Garcia as Midnight, and um, one of my favorite comedians, one half of Garfunkel and Oates, Kate Micucci is going to be in this season as well. But I don't know who she's going to play. So um. Zed, we'll go to you first. What are your expectations for this particular season of Supergirl? Foremost, I'm not exactly either sure. I'm not sure either what Leviathan is, but when I heard about it, part of me is hoping that it's some similar to. Uh, if you're not sure what the light is, it's it's something. It's a another show, pretty much a show organization that's being featured in like, movies. But I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, Supergirl of the season because Supergirl, tell you the truth, was my favorite show. And even though, okay, to say to say that it's a show about aliens, a lot of troops last year. So, to uh, the ramifications of that this season, and hopefully, trust this stuff again because we said control of a lot of things last year and. Uh, shout out to John Cryer because he I think he did an amazing job. At, well, I, I was always under the impression that Michael Rosenbaum was, was the best list. And to me, he still is, but damn great lesson. And so, sorry if I can't. But, uh, I'm, damn, uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Looking forward to seeing the ramifications that was revealed in, at the end of season uh, four because we, oh yeah uh, well if you think about secret identities as uh, you heard during our last discussion and for opportunities time after time after time again her best friend he is let's tell us uh the truth about cars being super supergirl, there's gonna be hell with the page this season. To a lot. Oh yeah, I, I, I don't know how I forgot that, but yeah, Lena Lou finally figured it out that Cara's that Cara Danvers and Supergirl are the same person. So um thank God for that. We don't we don't have to play that game anymore. And yeah, how is that gonna affect their friendship? And by the way, Zed, I do agree with you that out of the uh, like four core shows that all tie together 
Supergirl was probably the best handled last television season. Um, I'm not going to say it was perfect, uh, but I'm going to say it was the best of the four because, like, we're going to talk about Legends in a little bit, but Legends is meant to be silly. Arrow and Flash are meant to be taken a little more seriously, and there were just a lot of weird decisions uh, being made uh, in terms of the character arcs or of the, the entirety of the story itself. Uh, whereas Supergirl, it, it knew where it wanted to end, and it kept you invested with the inclusion of Lex Luthor, played by John Cryer, who I knew for a fact was going to nail this role. You it never doubt a comedic actor being able to portray drama. Uh, but Malcolm, your your thoughts regarding uh, season five of Supergirl and what's to come? Um, yeah, I, I don't really know much about Leviathan either. Um, but from the way some people are acting, sort of at the end of um, the finale, like I'd imagine that Leviathan is kind of a mind control kind of thing, like creating a big hive mind if that makes any sense um so that could be it i don't know if that's true or not but um yeah i, I mean john choir coming back um is great um like i didn't know what to expect from his version of um lex like i didn't have any doubt that comedic actors can do drama i just have never really been a big fan of John Quine and didn't think he would have been a good Dex Luthor, to be honest. But um, it, one thing I do hopefully um, cross over those, I hope Michael Rosenbaum is, is in there in some form and you get the, um, the, the, the Lex squad teaming up. That'd be great. Um, so I just looked at a thing uh, about the the writing for this particular season, and it's being the, this coming season is being described as the Black Mirror season. Basically, they're going to talk about how technology is impacting the world we live in and how it's it, affecting our ability to engage with others. Um, so the, that might be where Le Leviathan takes the hive mind control that you were thinking about, of like they use people's stones as a gateway to control their minds. And also, we're getting the 100th episode in this particular season so there is going to be one of the and usually what happens when they do a 100th episode is they do like sort of a recap or they do something that honors everything that's happened before it hence probably why Lex Luthor is going to be coming back I mean I know he was supposed to be in the crossover because there is probably an earth in which he survived uh Actually, I'm going to make a prediction. I wouldn't be surprised if John Cryer dons like the Lex Luthor version of the Superman suit for the crossover Something um, to think about there. Well, well, the, well, the other one is, um, I, I think you're forgetting, um, you saw the monitor actually revive Lex at the end of the finale. Oh, shoot, I am forgetting <laughs> that. Actually, actually, thank you yeah. for that. Although, wouldn't you be, wouldn't it be awesome if my prediction came true, though? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I'm not saying that's not going to happen either, so... I, these crossovers are meant to reward. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm talking over you, Zed. No, it was no, it was fine. You said you were right. The crossovers are meant to reward people, and uh, interesting the way that Supergirl in the, in regards to the reviving Lex, because in all the other shows we saw, he just did a little peeking in, and he directly inter he directly interacted with the, uh, Oliver. But for him to X last year, to me, so I, I, I was he trying to do so. I was wet suit of all people, so uh, to see the ramifications of that. Um, so I think that pretty much covers uh, what's going to happen with Supergirl. We have our thoughts, we have our speculations, uh, but we one thing's for sure, we know Leviathan is going to have a presence, and we now know that it's going to focus on like how technology is affecting our society today. And that, I like that Supergirl is the topical show. It likes to focus on like the world in which we live and how we can make a better society. Um, Moving on to a show that is way out of left field compared to everything else we've talked about so far, The Legends of Tomorrow. My God, this show keeps modifying itself every season to fit something new. It, it, it loves being the wacky show. And, um, you know, basically where we left off last season was, first off, Zari is no longer a member of the team because 
that version of Zari has been retconned, or at least it's a, it, she exists in a different multiverse now because they changed the past so that uh, religion doesn't become outlawed in the future, which leads to Zari getting the amulet and becoming part of the team eventually. So now we've got her brother. He, he still has the mantle, and he's now a member of the official team. Um, also, Nora Dark is an official legend as well. So it's going to be cool to see her have more interaction with um, the people involved. It's crazy that Katie Lotz uh, and um, Dominic Purcell are, are still with this show after so long. Because they've, they've been in the Arrowverse for a long time. Yeah. Katie's been what, season two of Arrow and uh, two, no, season one of Flash, so yeah. I'll take it. Yeah, if, if she stays on for like an extra, if she stays on for like two extra seasons, then she'll be the official longest running member of the Arrowverse. Uh, like, that, that's crazy. Um, but nevertheless, when we let, when season four ended, for um, Legends of Tomorrow. Basically, all the uh, n- notorious historical figures were kind of put back where they belong. Um, actually, no. Uh, like, they, they were... Like, their their souls are trapped somewhere in hell, aren't they? Well, uh, well, well yeah. Some, like, the evil legendary figures... Well, the e- evil characters that they were... The souls that they were capturing, yes. Oh, God, Legends. Legends was it's just weird, but, but it's great at the same time. The way the, the season ended was the world pretty much uh, used to our world became used to the fact that there are as good you know, like that not all monsters and want to eat you or kill you. I mean, because we had a great rendition of Sweet Baby James by the whole cast of Legends Tomorrow, which was That was so good. That was so good. That was so good. It was was. (laughs) So, like, I feel like it was about acceptance, and as you already covered, uh, because they changed the past already, because because they changed the past, it's technically still in her own feature, so... She said to come back sometime this this season. Hey, I don't know. And they're gonna weaken that, but I'm looking forward to that as well. But this, this, this season of Legends, the one show I can say honestly, what to expect. Uh, uh, Hell is gonna be brought back in some major way because. Um, also, at the end of last season, her name, I think it's Astra, who's now a grown woman, had done uh, L all those years ago. She's now a bit, bit timer in hell, and she took somebody's soul to, like, I, I guess a, a bank or something hell, and she's going to be raising some this season. Uh, Malcolm, anything from you? <laughs> um. Yeah, Legends is the one that um, I know that to expect the unexpected. Mm -hmm. Um, But um, uh, the the other thing is, you mentioned about the cast, is um, it it is known that um, both um, Noah Dark and Ray Palmer is finishing off the season as well, because um, they're going to be leaving at some stage, um, in which... They're both, I believe they're married in real life anyway, so that's kind of interesting. But, um, but yeah, I mean, this is the one that I is crazy. Uh, because for what I've sort of read online is that Astra is going to be releasing the souls of like some famous villains um, into the world. So that's probably what who the legends are going to try and um try and have to find this season because um, some names that are mentioned as Charles Manson and Genghis Khan will be released um, from hell so that's, yeah. um, 
And apparently the preview episode is going to be done in the style of a mockumentary. <laughs> oh, we're getting, a, what, 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 we're getting a Parks and Rec style episode. That's going to be awesome. Yeah. As I think it's something to do with the legends becoming sort of somewhat famous now and it all getting to the go to the heads now. And I think that's why they're doing the mockumentary episode. So that's. It uh, makes sense because. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. It does make sense that they will be kind of down now because they're saved their end from being. By hellish demons and stuff. So, that they're so famous that a mockumentary, that somebody's trying to make a documentary about them. Is, is this show's already a uh, first premiere episode is going to be. For a note, I think this season is also Legends is going to be part of the crossover. Yes, and it is. And hashtag it, whatever people. That part of the crossover, the crossover is officially a fail. If people is not part of the crossover, it's a fail. Period. If I don't see a world full of Bebo, I'm, I'm over. I, I don't know if the world can handle that much Bebo. I don't. I don't know if it can. Um. Well, before we move on to The Flash, uh, uh, one last thing should be noted is that the episode, the fifth episode of this season, titled Mortal Kombat, which I'm assuming is where we'll get Genghis Khan, this is Katie Lotz's directorial debut. So that's going to be... I'm excited to see what she brings to the table from a behind-the-scenes perspective. And, uh, you know, it, it, she being a, a stunt woman and a dancer, uh, uh, like, she... she I feel like this is right up her alley if it's going to be like a full-on Mortal Kombat-style episode with one of the most notorious warlords of all time. So, uh, moving on to The Flash. So, basically, before we get into what's going to happen for this season, let me just state for last season, there was a lot of stuff we could have maybe done without. It just it just felt like this that particular season was plagued by uh, it was plagued by smart people making stupid decisions. Am I wrong? Yeah, you're not wrong. You're, you're not wrong. There are smart people making with stupid decisions. So we want to talk about those speed and those dollars or so. Like, season five was not a bad season of the Flash. Like, I liked it a lot. Uh, it's just that not as smart as they should have been at all. And again, as I said, we, we know it earlier, I hate it when pe- smart people do stupid things. So, what can you do? What can you do? Um, Malcolm, any thoughts on last season of The Flash for you? I, I think you were a little bit more positive about it, weren't you? Malcolm? Or freeze guy to my think. Yeah. Well, um, well, I'll just keep going. I'll just keep going, and uh, maybe he can jump back in once he gets this issue figured out. Um, so what I know for season six is that um, obviously every single season of The Flash, they introduce a new version of Tom Cavanaugh as Harrison Wells. And in this case... Tom Cavanaugh is actually going to be playing three characters this season. His version of Reverse Flash is going to be returning, obviously, for the crossover. Um, he, he's bringing in a new version of Harrison Wells. And that particular version of Harrison Wells is going to be crucial towards the Crisis on Infinite Earths event. And he's also going to be playing a third character called Pariah, which is basically going to be like the Paul Revere to the Anti-Monitor. Like, he's going to let him... He's, he's going to sort of be the informant to the Anti-Monitor and let him know, like, there are metas here. It's time to strike. This and that and this and that. And uh, I'm very curious to see what kind of... Dyn- like, he's getting a lot of work here for this season, getting to just explore his acting chops every which way. Um, 
We also know that uh, we, we got a glimpse of a, of Barry's newest costume for this season. It, 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 they keep making it look more and more like it does in the comics as, since Rebirth happened. Um, and it, like, it just shows that like the technology is catching up to they can do the costumes they want to do and not have the, the speedy scenes be affected by the look of anything. Um, yes, Malcolm, we can see you now. So welcome back. Um, and um, finally, uh, we have a new villain for this season. His name is Bloodwork, a.k.a. Ramsey uh, Rosso. Um, and he is played by Sendhill uh, Ramamurthy. That's a that's a rough name to pronounce, <laughs> um, but I am basically it, it, this in the comics. This is a character that can control blood. It can manipulate blood. Like Chris, if you're still listening in the background uh, while running the stream, basically he's a bloodbender in the comics. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if he's gonna be. I don't know if he's gonna be doing the same thing here, but uh, but I, I I think he wants to like use his powers to maybe get rid of other Meta's powers. I'm not entirely sure. But um, his relationship to the rest of the Flash cast will be based on past working relationships with the character of Caitlin Snow, Killer Frost, played by Danielle Panabaker. So um, I'm curious to see... I'm assuming it's going to be like a first interaction in a long time gone wrong. And then he's just like, oh, well then, screw you guys. Powers, manipulate, evil, stuff like that. Um, am, I, am I wrong to think that, Zap? No, I just think you're wrong. I just hope you're not going to go with he's going to be taking people's powers. Cicada did your life. I'm, but I'm very interested in, uh, in the cover book show. Because I, I cannot pronounce his name, but um, Dr. Suresh from Heroes. So I'm oh. interested to see him back on uh, a hero, in a hero type of show. And I, again, I didn't know much about this character at all. I believe he's a good actor, first and foremost. So I believe whatever he, uh, he's going to be up to, he's, he's going he's gonna to do it well. I think he's going to portray his character well. And uh, also, uh, one thing that we didn't mention also was looking forward to uh, at the end of the last scene of last uh, of the season four, season five finale was we saw that infamous newspaper, two thousand twenty four, tick down in prices, two thousand nineteen, or to see how Team Flash deals with that. Cisco's no longer vibe anymore. There's a lot of good ramifications that from last season as well. But I'm looking forward to, to also seeing how work uh, fits into this whole scenario. And again, knowing Flash, knowing how the Flash works, he's probably going to be the villain for maybe like the first half of this season. I just I hope it's a good first half that he's part of. Um, so I, I just took a little bit look more at the information. Um, first off, Daniel Panabaker is going to be, along with uh, Menhaj Huda, they're going to be directing the fifth and sixth episodes of the season, respectively. So uh, congratulations to Danielle Panabaker. Uh, I don't think it's her directorial debut, but it's nice to see her in the directing chair. Um, also, uh, Killer Frost is going to get a new bluer costume, so that's going to be cool. Um, and, uh, basically this season, uh, of the flash, uh, according to what I have written in front of me, it's going to be split into two halves. So I guess you've got like season six, a and season six B and blood work is going to be the big bad of season six, a, and I'm going to assume that season six B will kind of follow, uh, it'll be post crisis. That'll be, a, that'll have a big role in like who the big bad is. Could be the reverse flash. Maybe he's still kicking somehow after the crisis event. I don't know for certain, uh, for certain, but uh, it remains to be seen. Malcolm, any thoughts from you before we move on to Arrow? Um, yeah, I, I can't wait to see sort of where um, Flash does end up going um, with this season because um, 
I I've been I'm probably in the minority, but um, I actually really like last season of Flash um, the most out of the four um, four Flash shows. Uh, well, the four Arrowverse shows, but um, and so I can't wait to see sort of Mahinda, so, um the central Wimmer, Mama Murphy um, in this because I he, he was one of my favorite characters and heroes, and just coming out to see sort of how. Like he does as like the villain, just how it sort of ends up. Um, but yeah, and I, I think it is Daniel Peter Baker's directorial debut because I think last season you had um, uh, Ke- uh, Kevin uh, um, direct his episode for the first time. But so yeah, um, I'm pretty sure it's the first time Danielle's directed this season. Huh. Well, um. It, it, I'm I'm excited to see what's to come. Um, I, I know the the Flash. I would assume, with the exception of the Flash and Arrow, are probably going to tie into Crisis the most for the first half of their seasons because, like, um, uh, obviously, the the monitor is going to have a big role with those two characters. Those were the two that started this whole thing. Um, like the, the Arrowverse would not exist without the characters of Oliver Queen. And very, and very Allen. That was a brief cameo from Chris Noman in the background. <laughs> um, but you know, um, let's rip the band-aid off now. So we got to talk about Arrow Season Seven. And basically, I like to say Arrow Season Seven. It suffered from Luke Cage Season One syndrome, which was basically like it had a really good premise for its first half, and then it, all of a sudden in the second half, it had no idea. What to do it had i think it had someone they wanted to put on the pedestal as the big bad but they waited too long to pull the trigger trying to figure out who they uh, uh thinking like oh let's set this big bad by having this bad big bad proceed it i mean um um not proceed but uh like lead up to it and they, they just didn't give themselves enough time they shot themselves in the foot there was a lot of show there was a lot of telling as opposed to showing like uh, apparently Roy Harper died and got res- resurrected via the Lazarus pit and we don't see it. We just find out about it in a conversation. And then of course we had all those flash forwards, which at first I thought they showed a lot of promise. Uh, but then it just got to a point where it looked like everyone involved in those flash forwards did not want to be on the show much longer than they had to be. Like they're just like, we're kind of just trudging along until we get to Crisis on Infinite Earths because we know that Oliver basically sold his soul here uh, to save Kara and Barry. Uh, and now what's going to happen with that deal as we get into Season 8, which is only going to be 10 episodes, if I'm correct. So, so like, this is going to be the final season of Arrow because Stephen Amell is going to be doing a job, is going to be doing a new show on stars about a wrestling heel, uh, which is in, in itself sounds like a great show. And I'm probably, I, I would be tempted to do like reviews of that show weekly as it airs. Uh, but um, yeah, so I don't think Emily Bet Records is coming back for this season. Um, I don't even know really who the main villain is. I think we're just going to be like trudging along until we get to like the official crossover event. Um, episode uh, one from Loki is going to be titled Starling City. Episode two is Welcome to Hong Kong. Episode three is Leap of Faith. Episode four is Present Tense. That doesn't really help me figure out what's going on at all. So, man, man what, what, what do we do here? What, uh, like, we, we do know that they're going to be bringing back certain characters, and I think it's more more for the crossover and for other stuff. Like we've got Tommy Merlin coming back, Adrian Chase, Malcolm Merlin, Moira Queen, and um, Tatsu Yamashiro. So uh, that was Katana's real name, I believe. So, yeah. Um, yeah. We're, well, I guess we're going to be tying up whatever loose ends haven't been tied up yet in Arrow's mythology. I really feel like this, at least the first half, look, well, no, the first half. I feel like Arrow Season 8 is going to be kind of a tribute season a little bit because they're going to be bringing people back, like you said. said. But I also think 
flash forward because I don't think those kids are going away anytime soon. Uh, so I know Cat McNamara and B.S. Mia and all the other Future Force kids will be in the flashbacks. But I think as far as like the current timeline that we're in, I believe Arrow and uh, this will probably be the most of the mother in. I believe they're going to be going I believe they're going to be going to multiple Earths and recruit a team or something to battle the anti monitor again. Pure speculation, but I, and I think you'll probably come to moments and uh, probably come where mo- into moments where you can't say goodbye to his mother or something like that. And he, like actually alive on another universe or something. So it's going to be a way to ask characters in the Arrowverse kind of stay at the same time. And uh, hopefully Colin Salmon comes back now that Krypton is no longer a show. Um, uh, some of the old characters. Hopefully Manu Bennett. I'm not sure what his status is with Arrowverse, but like maybe uh, somewhere just in Europe. To again, so at least it's a tribute season up to the quite actual crisis. We don't know what's gonna happen, but we know that Oliver's not gonna make it out alive. So at least that's what we think. So I mean that that's pretty much the premise of the flash forwards is that Oliver doesn't survive. Like Mia barely gets to know her dad. Um, uh, so like. Yeah, and we're going to talk about potential spinoffs in, in in a little bit. But um, Malcolm, any any thoughts on what your predictions are for season eight? Um, yeah, because I I, I can't remember myself. But I remember seeing a quote from Stephen Amell saying that he pl- plays of some multiple versions of himself. So I'm thinking that it might actually be um. A, him and the monitor doing a whole buddy cop adventure go, uh, going to different um, multiverses um, and to tie up any loose ends or maybe picking up something that they may need to help for the crisis. I do think we'll see um, Felicity at least once, probably only in the fight finale though, as sort of a farewell thing for Red. Um, Oliver eventually dies, but I think he's not getting out of this alive as well. I think, but uh, I'm just uh, I, I'm, and I mean, honestly, I really hope it is a buddy cop adventure because that's something that I think is, will be very fun. Um, well, according to according to Stephen Amell and also Katie Cassidy Rogers, who plays um, Earth Two Laurel Lance uh, Black Canary, uh, formerly Black Siren. Um, the episodes of this final season of Arrow are going to be very episodic. So I guess that means they're going to feel very standalone-ish. So maybe that does play into the buddy cop stuff, like something happens on one Earth versus another Earth and whatnot, and this and that, as they get the crew they need to help fight the anti-monitor. Again, that's all speculatory. Um, But um, we'll see. We'll see, because we do know for a fact um, that um, this is definitely the last season of Arrow. And it, it, from what we've been teased, it doesn't look like Stephen Amell is going to make it out alive um, of this crossover event. And now we get to the 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 main thing you've been waiting for the crossover uh, the crossover event, Crisis on Infinite Earths. And um, yeah, <laughs> where, where, uh, it, this is we've been aware that this was going to be a thing since. The final episode, uh, it actually, it might have been the first episode of the Flash, uh, if I'm correct. Like it was the, it was that technically post-credit scene that we, that we saw with uh, Eobard Thawne in in the fake wheelchair that he didn't need, but was just using it to keep himself charged with the Speed Force. He was talking to Giddy in the hall, uh, the um, the AI, saying, "Pull up this date," and it looked like. This crossover wasn't supposed to happen for another few years. Like they 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 kept teasing, like oh, it's going to take place like ten years, at, uh, for like the the season the series finale if Flash lasted ten years, uh, much like how they approached Smallville with like they did ten seasons and then 
it ended with finally Clark wearing the costume and flo- and watching Earth from above. Um, I haven't gotten through all of Smallville, but uh, that was shown to me. So, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, we're getting it early. We're, we're getting it earlier than we expected. They kept pushing the Crisis on Infinite Earths event forward every season of The Flash because I... I, I don't know, maybe ratings were a concern, or maybe they were just like, let's get to it now while we still have the popularity and we still have the appeal of doing it. Um, so here we are, and we know for a fact that we're going to get uh, a lot of interesting characters in this particular thing. As I scroll up through this article here to try and figure out who's going to be in this. Um, let's see. We, we, we know John Cryer is returning. We know Tyler Hoechlin is returning as Superman. Uh, this event will include characters from Black Lightning. Um, my God Almighty, Kevin Conroy, who you know is the voice of that Batman. Boy. In, yeah, you know him as the voice of many iterations of Batman in animated form. He is going to be appearing as Bruce Wayne in live action. I'm assuming as an older version of Bruce Wayne, and I'm assuming as the Batman Beyond version of Bruce Wayne that is like uh, eventually going to take on the mentor role to carry uh, to Terry McGinnis. Um, hopefully, we get to see someone play him too. Uh, and Brandon Routh, who we already know as Ray Palmer the Adam, he is going to be um, donning the big red S on his chest for uh, for the first time since 2006. Um, won't be that same exact Superman. It'll be an alternate version of Superman, but he will be donning the red S on his chest Kingdom as Superman. Come, I believe. Yes, Kingdom Come is what I've heard as well. Um, and you, you, there, there are still rumors that, like, will the Titans cast appear? Will the Smallville cast appear? Minus Allison Mack because she's in jail. <laughs> um, th- th- so many possibilities as to what this will look like. But again, it all comes down to who is going to die. Is it going to be Oliver Queen or are they going to swerve us? We, uh, uh, I mean... And again, we all we've mentioned that Tom Cavanaugh he's going to have a big role in this particular crossover event as well with the multiple characters he's playing, um, and you know, uh, but potential backdoor pilots for other shows. Like uh, again, I just said possibly Batman Beyond, possibly Star City twenty forty, whatever. I'm not sure if twenty forty is the exact year or if it's a different year, um, but I, I I think it's twenty forty, um, or could it be like. Could it be a Superman family show? Like, we, we've heard, like, could Tyler Hoechlin be getting his own spinoff as Superman? And people have been like, isn't that kind of boring? But, like, what if it's him while he's a dad? Then that adds an entirely new layer to the character that we haven't seen explored in live action. Uh, uh, so that I, and that's, that brings an appeal to it that I wasn't thinking about before that I'm kind of curious to see now. But, Malcolm, I'm going to go to you first. What do you think will happen here? And before I forget, I almost forgot. Where's the Green Lantern ring for Diggle? Uh, 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 John. Uh, wait a minute. Um, but but yeah. Um, I like this. I don't know where to start with this because um, with all these cameos coming in. Um, I don't know sort of how big some of these are. Will they just be like a, um, just for like a big battle scene just shot or will they get some sort of kind of significance in here? Because there is also rumours that we're going to get Mark Hamill as the Joker as well. Um, it is only rumour. I do not know if it's true. But um, as um, some people have pointed out, he has technically done it by playing the trickster. So there is precedent for him to maybe come back and actually be the Joker, but, um, but, yeah, I mean, as for potential spin-off shows, um, Batman Beyond could be an interesting one, but, um, whether or not they do it, it's good, that's going to depend on if they've got plans for that in the movie world, because, um, I believe that... They don't, um, they don't, but they should, they should have plans for it, but they don't. So pull the pull the trigger on TV, please, for the love of God. This is me making a plea right now, Greg Berlanti. Do fucking Batman Beyond, please. Um, 
what I was about to say is if they do do it, um, they may have not be able to use um, Bruce Wayne. That's the because uh, they probably got special permission to for um, to appear in the um, crossover. But because they are doing that whole the new Batman movie, um, I don't think that's that's going to be the one that's going to hold a Batman Beyond live action thing back. Will be to try and figure out a way to do it out Bruce Wayne. But um, that doesn't like, really make any sense because Batman is appearing in Titan season two. Yeah, Bruce Wayne is at least now. Whether once again. Uh, they could have got special permission, so uh, for that, like it's 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 an interesting thing um, because yeah, um, which makes me think we're not getting a better steel too because um, yeah, so because that's what's what held those back. Anyway, we're going off topic, but um, but um, and I'm, I'm actually one of the ones that I really like the. Um, the future Star City um, flash forwards um, more than the actual uh, present day thing on on Arrow. So to see um, more of that, could, um, we'll actually, I'd actually like to see. But yeah, there's so many possibilities and so little time. <laughs> uh, Zadis, what about you? Let, let me say, in regards to Star City 2040, I'm really I'm somewhat against the idea of a uh, spin-off show coming from those those uh, kids. Of course, however, I would be more inclined to it if we see like media, and it was cool to see um and, and uh yeah, our adult Connor Hall because we know that he's also the son this uh. A step son of no adopted son, aka John Stewart, this last season of Arrow. So I'm I, I, that would be interesting to see more. Maybe in the spinoff, get lots more because Mia, the first hero go around, but she made a lot of stupid decisions last season. Rolling Cat, uh, Captain Matt Demers character, and there's so more to the idea of a, uh, of a Star City 2040 show. But as far as the cross, crossover goes, I, I think the sky's the limit. I do think, uh, kind of with Malcolm's buddy cop right there, you're picking certain people out from, uh, you're picking certain people out from certain, uh, certain universes. Maybe they're going to go back and pick up Prometheus and bring him a crossover, but I believe they're gonna eventually bring uh, uh going to 24 and probably be bring Mia back right, to be a part of the crossover somehow. Pure speculation, but I, I would like to see that be the case. Uh, and his daughter for one, uh, be able to fight together at least for one last time, <laughs> the first and last time. I thought it was going to be crazy again. I know the Superman, uh, Superman's going to be on here. You have Kingdom Come Superman. If I'm not mistaken, uh, Malcolm, is it Kingdom Come Superman just a little bit of an older version of Superman? Um, I'm, I think Kingdom Come might have been if the one where he ended up in. Uh, I'm not too. Like, yeah, I'm not too sure about here. That might be. That might be the Rush, um, a version of the Russian. I don't know. Well, yeah, because I know that. I think that may be Red Sun, but uh, I, I, I don't think when, as, as when I say older version of Superman, it definitely don't mean like Bruce Wayne. Oh, but I think this this might be the Superman that we see like the size or the gray streets in his hair, which again, Brandon Routh is already uh, graying a little bit, but. Uh, it's gonna be cool. I think the crossover is gonna be dope. Um, and on a spin off, that would be nice to see. I would also love to see uh, again how Black Lightning is gonna uh, how, how Black Lightning is gonna be figure is gonna figure into this uh, crossover because maybe they'll bring some ma- other medals, you know, and some good medals that can actually lead to maybe a, an outsider spin off show because. Um, 
the outsiders is another group of not I don't want to call them titans, but a, a group of me, uh, meta humans that were oh, another reference to Young Justice, but they're uh, a group of teens that are trying to, uh, but they're meta humans, so they also want to spread the word that meta humans are good and that we're not all bitchy monsters that you think they are. So I think there's so many good creatives that come from the show. The crisis is going to be the end of former fashion. It's open for uh, like for many more possibilities whenever the show goes off the air and whenever the crisis is done. I'm so excited for this. Um, we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. I'm I, I I'm excited because we, we know we're getting a new show after Arrow leaves. Uh, because they've announced, they've said so. They've said they're going to do that. I'm hopeful that one of my predictions comes true, and it is a Superman family show or a Batman Beyond show. Because I'm so sick of Bruce Wayne wearing the cowl, and it would be nice to see him take on more of a mentor role um, uh, to Terry McGinnis specifically. Um, but basically, the main thing I need from this crossover, Crisis on Infinite Earths, and I just said it. A while ago, but I'll say it again. We need John Diggle to have the Green Lantern ring. They teased it in the Elseworlds crossover. We we now know that John Diggle is an adopted member of the Stewart family. So he so he's technically John Stewart. Give him the ring. Give him the ring. Let's see what it looks like to have lanterns in the Arrowverse, for crying out loud, because even even all the way back to the first episode of Legends, like I think they mentioned something about lanterns, uh, uh, about um, um, what what what's what's his name? Uh, what, Rip uh, Rip Hunter? Yeah, Rip Hunter. Yeah. He, he he mentioned something about I've seen Superman and uh, I've seen Dark Knights and Men of Steel and and lanterns of all kinds. So it's there. It's there. Give him the ring. Um. It, and I wish I had a transition now to end the show, but I sadly do not. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, guys, seriously, the Arrowverse is going to be crazy as we head into the season premiere of, I think Batwoman is the first show premiering in, uh, out of all of these in October. So it's going to be exciting. We might do a recap show every week uh, heading into Crisis. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Um, if it happens, of course, but, um, Malcolm Zadius, thank you for being on. This was my first time hosting. And obviously just like over at Multiplex, I need to work on my pacing of these discussions, but nevertheless, it was a good first try. Um, and for those of you who stayed with us for this conversation, uh, you know what to do as always like share and subscribe dedicated to arts content including the who cares anyway podcast which you're watching slash listening to right now uh go join our new facebook group page go check us out uh, on our facebook business page as well check out our twitter at d2a channel check out our instagram of the same handle check out our youtube channel which you're already on right now if you're watching this live uh and check out some of our other videos as well like down to dissection with uh uh, with uh, Ryan McClellan and, and, and Chris Doman and whatever musical acts they bring to the table. Check out our Schmodown reactions with myself, Chris, and Case. Um, uh, we will be bringing back Viva La Resistance once Star Wars Resistance comes on. We will do a Mandalorian recap show once that premieres. Uh, so stay tuned for all the awesome stuff that we have coming up. And of course, we've got D2A's one-year anniversary coming up as well. Um, so before we get to um, the plugs from everyone here, I just want to say I was really hoping we could get Roxy Stryer on for this discussion, so I'm just going to throw this out there right now. If we don't do a weekly Arrowverse recap show, um, I would still like to do a part two of this discussion, and I would love to have Roxy Stryer on. So this is an open invitation to you, Ms. Stryer, if you would like to come on. We, I, we were all fans of Flash and Friends on Screen Junkies when it was around. Uh, we know how much this particular universe means to you. 
Uh, we know how much DC stuff means to you in general. Uh, so we'd love to have you on for a discussion if you'd like to accept that invitation. But with that said, Malcolm Lay, where can the good people of the internet find you as Chris drums his guitar in the background? <laughs> um, you, can find, you can find me hosting Rankum on Take 3 um, every Sunday night. You can find me hosting Formula Random um, coming up. Um, we've got a few good matches coming up. Um, you can also find me all over the place on Twitter, Leadbox, Stardust, at Melkor. And the John Diggle to my Oliver Queen, the Luke Cage to my Danny Rand, Zaddy Seaman Smith, Multiplex's reigning TV throwdown champion of the world. Where can the good people of the internet find you? Y'all can find me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at, if I search my name, Zaddy Smith. That's Z A Smith. D underscore Z A D D or on Instagram at Zaddy's again, that's Z A two D's E U S. Also, do have a letter box as well where I've ranked uh, uh, like movies, my favorite old MCU movies. Uh, just search my name again, Zaddy Smith, Z A two D's E U S. Uh, you can also find me with TV reviews on the Star Stardust app, Fusion Z. I'm on there. Find me uh, movie and TV trivia at the Multiplex, where I am still the one Arrowverse champ, current TV throwdown champion. So, Multiplex Entertainment, where you can find me on Facebook. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube at Nico Suave Regoli or just Nico Suave with four random meaningless numbers thrown in at the end on Discord. Instagram and Snapchat still coming soon. I will get to those eventually, I promise. Uh, check out Combat Wrestling Trivia on Facebook, Combat Wrestling Network on YouTube. The fully made Twitter handle is at Combat Wrestling, the number two. There is no letter G. We just had two title matches yesterday. They were both Iron Man matches, a 30-minute Iron Man match for the heavyweight championship between champion Andrew Hayes and challenger slash commissioner Hunter Champless, as well as Jacob Barber taking on James Berryman III for the inaugural World Course Weekly Ironman Championship. That was a 20-minute match, so go check both of those out as well. Um, Rolling Crits on YouTube, at Rolling Crits on Instagram. My friends here in New Kensington really need to get that show back up and running. And, of course, I've been plugging Trivia for Thon 2 coming up in January. Uh, Call to Action versus Dedicated to Art is going to be one of the main events, three-on-three three in the movie Trivia Face-Off. And Malcolm, we've also discussed this, Full Metal Random will have a presence as part of Trivia for Thon 2. It will be a five-way Schmodown trivia Iron Man match between a member of D2A, a member of C2A, a member of Take 3, and also Abby Friel and Albert Weirdorama, uh, all reactors, so that'll be awesome as well. I'm working on getting Combat Wrestling Trivia, a presence in Trivia for Thon. Full Metal Classic will have two matches for that week. And Zadius, I'm working on making sure that you have a TV Throwdown Championship title defense for that week as well. It's just a matter of timing, but stay tuned for that as well. I got you, buddy. But from all of us here at Dedicated to Art, Malcolm Goldie Lay, Zadius Smith, myself, and Chris Doman, who is running the stream in the background. You know what to do until next time. Take care. <laughs>